Hi guys and welcome to another video. Today we continue with another game of a world champion but this time not in the 19th century but in the middle of the 20th century. And the game we will have a look at is Bobby Fischer, quite legendary player in the 1960s and 70s and his opponent is a probably Spanish guy named Gadia. They played in Mar del Plata in 1960. And the game is very instructive and it had a great impact on my positional understanding of chess when I was younger. So let's have a look at the game, which started with the Sicilian Night Dwarf defense. White played the open Sicilian and black played the Night Dwarf, which is characterized by a6. Fischer used to play bishop c4 all the time in um, this period. And um, nowadays this line is not as popular, but back then uh, when there were no strong computers, this plan, which he employed quite often, was quite powerful. And the idea is he wants to target this e6 pawn with the bishop, with the knight and sometimes with the pawn and sometimes also sacrifice. And this can be quite sharp and quite dangerous. For example, um, yeah, black needs to know his stuff, needs to know something about this capture. Is it possible or is it too dangerous and so on. Black is fine here, could for example play some move like knight e7 and according to current theory, black is maybe even slightly better. But back in the days, this was not possible and black played a move after which he got in trouble quite quickly. After knight c6, white took and black took and white put pressure with f5. Now it's not so easy for black to deal with this because Nobody really wants to put this bishop back to d7 from c6, where it's already well developed. But also, you don't want to give up this square here, right? Because um, white can have good control here and it's not so easy to cover. Nor do you want to open the center like knight e4, knight e4, bishop e4, pawn e6 because the black king is just stuck in the center and the white king is pretty safe. So we don't want to do this either. So it's already not so easy here. And um, in the game he decided to play e5. So after this white already has a huge advantage. Uh, a better chance would have been something like take on f5 maybe. And after rook takes just develop and later there might be some counterplay along the e-file. I can also target this pawn, which is not the case. If the center is closed, then black has less activity and it's not so easy to create counterplay. So let's continue with the game where e5 was played and white could have obtained some advantage with bishop to g5, but probably he didn't like this because Black could win a pawn now on e4 because after queen b6, unpinning the knight, the knight is ready to take here. However, this position is still quite bad for black, but it's not so easy to understand this. And maybe even Bobby Fischer did not understand how good this is for him because basically white is a pawn down and the position is still very close, so there is no direct attack. But one way to play on here with a huge advantage would be play f6, after which black needs to keep everything closed to limit, white, to limit white's options. And after this, white tries to open on the other side. And there are a lot of problems for black. For example, the bishop on f8, it cannot even make a move. So the black king will be stuck in the center for even much longer. And also white is ready to open the position on the other wing. However, this is not easy because things are quite slow. White is 
developing a slow initiative. It's not like white is crushing through and white is a pawn down. So this was probably not so easy to judge. Fischer instead decided to protect his pawn on e4 first with queen to d3, which looks reasonable because possibly I can go bishop to g5 later, which is definitely one of our plans and we soon reach such a position. And after bishop to g5, queen b6, king h1, castles, it's the first moment where I want to ask you to make a move and it's a very crucial moment in the game. So take your time and especially think about the question, which pieces do you want to trade? Do you want to trade on f6? Don't you want to trade on f6? Do you want to put something to d5? Don't you want to put something there? Um, and we will continue with the solution. The best move is to take on f6. Why is this so important? Um, it's so important because we want to get control of the d5 square. d5 square is a weakness here and we want to occupy it with a piece, in the best case with a knight. And we cannot do this immediately because, for example, in this line, black could take with the knight. Our bishop is undefended, so we cannot take on d5 really. And if we take e7, we even lose a piece. So. We should probably take here with the pawn, but okay, black could take here and we take here and our pawn on c6 is, I think, more of a weakness than a strength. And black is doing more or less okay. Also, black could take with the bishop first, which is maybe even stronger because white cannot take with the bishop because this would blunder a piece. And if he takes with the pawn, then white did not succeed in putting a piece to d5. So that's why we need to fight for the control of the d5 square first by eliminating one defender. And after this trade, we have a pleasant choice, which are both quite reasonable. So the first move is already the key move. After this, knight d5 is advantage for white, but not so clear because some kind, uh, somehow the bishop is a bit superfluous because they both want to go to d5, but only one of them can go there and black might not uh, need to trade. So the bishop is a bit stuck. Black could also trade, hoping for some opposite bishops. Of course, the white bishop is much better, but black has reasonable chances, especially in end games, to save the game. So that's why it's not recommended to go there with the knight first because maybe the opposite bishops will grant some drawing chances but also there is queen d8 after which is not so easy um, to do something with the knight except then taking and white needs to be aware that um, black could take also later so it's not so easy and taking it would just solve black's problems a bit more because Yes, d6 is weak, but e4 is equally weak and black can cover d6 quite comfortably. So the best move here is bishop to d5. And now we trade those bishops. The bishop cannot escape because there is a rook behind and it would drop the exchange. Also b4 doesn't work because I can trade the bishops and my knight will enter on d5 anyway. So that's a good move. And after rook c8, white was trading here and um, now it's the next step to transfer the knight to d5. You might wonder why didn't he do it right now, because it seems like a good situation, hitting the queen, hitting the bishop, but black has one move which keeps the balance and this might be quite surprising. Everything else is already losing. And you can challenge yourself trying to find black's only resource not to be just lost here positionally. And the answer is queen to d4. And this is really strong. Black is attacking this pawn and black is not afraid of the double pawn because now this c2 pawn suddenly is also very weak. Even if white can double another pawn, c2 will be a target and black has counterplay. So here white 
is sadly not better and uh, black is okay. So that's the problem. Instead, if black would go back, then white would reach his dream position playing c3. There will never be pressure down here. The knight is dominating the bishop and white can slowly improve the position. How he can do this? This will be the next question to you in the game where white first started with rook d1 and only now played knight to d5. Probably some idea was to have a good response after queen d4. Um, and the good response um, is probably just check and check, winning the black queen. So that's quite tricky. No longer queen d4 is possible. And so the queen went back. White played c3, preventing all the counterplay. B4 is no counterplay because I take with the knight. And it's not easy to organize e a5 because b5 would always drop. So black kind of played a waiting strategy, defending passively. But it's up to white now to find a plan how to win the game. Of course, many moves are winning, basically any move, but we need to come up with a plan. Even though the computer shows the position is winning, we need to come up with a plan how to actually win it. And so I will ask you, what would you suggest for white? How can we improve the position? I will discuss some ideas. Um, first, I will discuss ideas which are not working well and um, this is f6 this is something i don't really like this was the approach i was thinking was good when i saw this for the first time when i was uh, 10 years younger i thought i want to attack the king i want to open the position there but the problem is even though white has a good position here still black got rid of this very ugly bishop and now white needs to prove something because he's even a pawn down and he doesn't have the stable advantage of a strong knight versus a bad bishop. So those advantages are gone, gone and the only advantage is the weak king and we really need to show something. Still, okay, it's possible, but it's very risky. You even uh, risk um, being worse if your attack is not successful and there is no clear mate. So. Maybe you win back the pawn and keep some pressure. That's the, the maximum, I think, which is there. So this is not recommended. Other stuff you could do is try to organize some attack with maybe rook here, rook here and bring the queen over. That's kind of reasonable. Also starting with queen g3, trying to get f6 in um, is quite possible. But Fischer found a very nice plan, which I honestly back then did not even consider and this was rook to a1 and once you really understand this this will yeah uh, get your positional understanding to another level because this advantage it will just stay forever if we don't trade it away so don't trade it away meanwhile white wants to create another weakness and this is on the queen side those pawns are in the minority and it's quite easy to trade one pair of pawns and then one pawn will be isolated and we will attack it later. For example, if black is just waiting around, let's say f6, then protecting his pawn, we will kick the rook, we will take on b5 and we will finally also attack the b5 pawn, we will bring the other rook. All our pieces are really well placed and black cannot attack anything. c3 is very well defended, e4 is well defended, the bishop is passive and white is already ready for some tactics after rook b8, rook b5 is possible. So that's quite nice how he did it um, with this rook a1 idea, trying to create a further weakness, keeping the advantage with we, which we already have, not trading it away immediately. So we will have a look how the game actually finish, finished and this was quite surprisingly quick. After rook a1, black played f6 because he was still worried about f6, which 
why it might go, but not necessarily now. So um, white just continued with his plan, but black panicked a little bit and overlooked some tactics. After rook b8, you can try to find the final tactics. Um, shouldn't be that difficult and um, we will continue with the solution. It's just checking the captures and after knight d7 he resigned because there is queen d5 winning the rook next and game is over. So quite instructive positional win. The two things you should take out of this is first how to fight for the d5 square by just eliminating the defenders and getting the right trades. And after that, what is maybe even more instructive is once you have reached some static advantage with a strong knight versus a bad bishop, don't change this away so quickly, but try to create new weaknesses. And that's exactly how he did it. And that's also why he won this game so quickly. So that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. And if so, please like and subscribe. And I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.